Hello and welcome to this video on financial institutions. Uh, over the course of this lecture, we're going to dissect the two broad types of financial institutions and then talk through uh, some of the different types of financial institutions within those two broad categories. Um, this is, of course, uh, something that's important for being able to manage money is being aware of some of the different resources and some of the different uh, ways that we can um, maybe put our money for the short term. Uh, so not understanding this will under help you to understand some of your options. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about financial institutions in, in general here. Uh, and so when we talk about a financial institution, really we're just simply talking about some sort of entity uh, that uh, helps manage money in some way. It's very broad, of course. Now, when we're looking at financial institutions, though, we typically lump them into two broad categories. So the first category is what we would call a depository. Let me do that. Depository institution. And we're going to start here. So a depository institution, uh, really, very simply, uh, is characterized by some sort of institution uh, that accepts deposits, meaning that you can go into one of these uh, entities and you can choose to give your money and they can hold it for a period of time. Okay, so that's a depository institution, right? They allow you to um, put your money on hold there and then it will be available uh, at some point in the future when you choose to access it again, right? So this is kind of our conventional understanding of what a bank does broadly. It's a depository institution. Um, so uh, there are several different types of depository institutions, and some you're going to be very familiar with, and others you're probably not going to be that very familiar with. Starting with the ones that you're probably already pretty familiar with, um, we have everybody's understanding of what the, uh, a bank and what we call a commercial bank. And so a commercial bank... Um, very specifically, is usually what we think of when we think of a depository institution, uh, but you might be mixing this up with a credit union. So a commercial bank uh, is actually offers a full range of services. So think offers checking accounts, savings accounts, maybe has lending services, maybe provides loans and those sorts of things. Um, but really the characteristics that separate a commercial bank from some of the other entities, beside, in addition to accepting deposits, which they all do, is a commercial bank is typically organized as a corporation. Uh, so a, a commercial bank usually has uh, stockholders, uh, it has a board of directors, right? chief executives. Cor commercial banks are oftentimes, not always, but can be publicly traded. So think about the big commercial banks like Chase and Wells Fargo. Um, I mean, those are, those are just huge commercial banks, and they provide a wide portfolio of different services. And the benefit of a commercial bank is they do offer pretty much everything. And so that's going to give you access to a lot of different things. They typically are nationwide. And so in terms of having access to ATMs and different things and access to branches, if that's important to you, uh, a commercial bank is going to be the, the way to go because you're going to have access to um, services regardless of your geographic location for that reason. Now, it is a corporation though, right? They, these are for-profit entities. And so because of that, you're typically going to see maybe uh, getting charged for certain services that you might not be with other institutions. Uh, and so that's one thing to consider is that those services do come at a cost and the uh, entity, in this case, the commercial bank, uh, is a for-profit entity. So ultimately their goal is pursuing profit uh, and that is a kind of uh, kind of a guiding principle behind the decisions they make. Now, another type of depository institution that functions very similar to a commercial bank uh, is a credit union. Now, I know in many areas there are credit unions, and they're very very popular. They're typically smaller relative to commercial banks, usually serving consumers within a specific geographic area. Uh, might be within a city, could be within a county, could be within a region, but they typically are a little bit smaller. Sometimes they serve people based upon occupation. That's pretty common. And a credit union does a lot of the same things that a commercial bank does, right? You can go in, you can deposit money. The difference is, though, is that typically credit unions are member or user owned. Uh, and that means that credit unions aren't for-profit entities. They're actually non-profits. 
Now, that doesn't mean the entity can't earn a profit, but that, of course, means that it's not the number one thing, right? The credit union, its goal is to serve its members. That's its purpose. Uh, and so a credit union will have uh, sort of like a, a board um, and then it will have probably a, a CEO, but it doesn't have shareholders. And so its shareholders, while we don't own stocks because it's a nonprofit, but its goal is to operate in a way that benefits the members. So that provides a number of different benefits, right? And usually um, credit unions are a little bit more flexible with regards to services, typically, not always, but can provide better service because again, they're, they're not as concerned with profitability. Uh, it's ultimately serving the members in the better interest of members. And so they can offer lower rates, which is always great to get up with a credit union. Uh, the, the downside, if there is a downside, I would say, is that they tend to be more conservative. And so getting a loan with a credit union, they might have a higher bar for what that looks like. And that's partly because uh, they're not as risky, right? They don't have as much access to capital like a commercial bank would that can raise money from investors. And so they tend to be a little bit more risk adverse. Uh, and so you might require a higher credit score and those sorts of things. But if you can kind of pass those initial things and, and, and you know, pass the credit qualifications and income qualifications, then usually you can benefit from lower interest rates and better terms and those sorts of things. Now, in addition to those, some less common depository institutions include things like mutual savings banks, which I'm not going to talk about very much because, frankly, these aren't totally relevant anymore. Uh, but a mutual savings bank is essentially depositor owned, uh, so sort of similar to a credit union in some ways. Uh, but they're not necessarily geographically very prominent. And so we predominantly see these like in the northeast in the United States. Um, is generally when you will see this type of institution, um, you know, usually can provide higher rates on things like savings accounts, but again, not very widespread as far as geography goes. Uh, another one that we also don't see very often is a savings and loan association. And the reason for this is, I don't know if you have studied, um, in the 1980s, there was the huge savings and loan crisis where literally like Hundreds of savings and loan institutions failed um, for a variety of reasons, which we're not going to necessarily get into. Uh, but I say that to convey that they're not very common because of that. Um, so a savings and loan association, and I realize I just left out kind of a very important word, which is loan. Uh, so a savings and loan, or an SNL for short, uh, usually specializes in uh, savings accounts and then making mortgages, right? So you have a savings account, people make deposits. And then what the savings and loan or the SNL does is it then turns that into a mortgage. Now, much like our most recent mortgage crisis in 2008, savings and loans got into some issues making riskier investments. And of course, that money is supposed to be a savings account, which is generally pretty liquid, right? People put their emergency funds in savings accounts because they want them to be liquid. Uh, and so that created a number of issues. SNLs are now much more regulated, and they're just not as common uh, as a result of some of those things. So those are depository institutions. Again, the kind of commonality between them is that they all accept deposits. You can go in there and deposit money, keep it in the account, and then you can access it later on. Uh, you can move it between accounts and all those different things. How they vary ultimately is how they do that, though, and the ancillary services that they offer. Again, with commercial banks offering the broadest portfolio or broadest range, and then kind of moving down and we get a little bit more narrow and a little bit more specialty, you would say. Now, contrast that with non-depository institutions, which I'm sure you're kind of thinking ahead and you realize, hey, if a depository institution accepts deposits from account holders, then a non-depository institution does not accept deposits from account holders. And you would be right. Way to go. Um, so non-depository institutions or non-deposit institutions, I like non-depository. It actually just sounds a little cooler. But another one in which you're not going to hold an account and you're not going to hold money in, right? So with these accounts over here, right, usually you have to start by, you know, putting a, creating an account, right? Whether it's maybe like a savings account and you've got to put like $5 in it and then that allows you to 
access the other services that are available. With a non-depository institution, they don't have those same um, they don't have those same restrictions because you don't have an actual deposit account with them. So non-depository institutions are helpful though because they usually provide other services that you might not be able to obtain through depository institutions. So these include things like life insurance companies, which as you know, a life insurance company, you can either select term or whole life. We'll talk about that a little bit later in future lecture. Uh, and of course, you pay a premium and then, you know, depending upon the term, let's say it's 10 years, if you die, then in, under the provisions of the policy, a certain amount of money is paid out upon your death and proof of that. That's life insurance. So that's a non-depository institution. Uh, we also have investment companies, which are another example of depository institutions. Uh, these can commonly take the form of a mutual fund. I'm going to write out mutual fund here. Uh, and I don't want to get too far into this because, again, we're going to explore this in, in future lectures. Uh, but a mutual fund being an entity that's going to take money from a lot of different sources and it's going to invest that money to pursue a particular objective. And so it could invest in stocks, bonds, commodities, a combination thereof, uh, equities associated with uh, emerging markets or developed nations or developing nations, whatever it might be. Um, that would be an investment company. Uh, you can also have brokerage companies, commonly referred to simply as a brokerage firm. And so a brokerage firm um, is kind of people's traditional view of investing where you hire an advisor and then that advisor is going to recommend a variety of different funds and they're going to help you buy and sell stocks and those sorts of things. They're going to help you manage your portfolio. That's a brokerage fund. So they're kind of an intermediary, right? Instead of you going through uh, a brokerage firm platform or a discount fund platform and then purchasing your own stocks and bonds and balancing portfolios and figuring that out, you can go with a brokerage firm and they're going to help assess what's best for you and then execute that strategy and buy and sell for you and periodically update you on the process. Of course, that is a service that you pay for. Typically, it's a percentage of the holdings that you have. So you do want to be aware of that to make sure because that can affect your final yield. If your stocks are growing at 10%, but you're paying 3 to 4% in advisor fees and other fees associated with your funds, you know, you're really only getting 6 to 7, which is a little bit different than 10%, of course. Uh, moving on down the chain, we have uh, credit card companies. And credit card companies, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because this is something that everybody is very familiar with. Uh, but obviously, those institutions that provide short-term credit. Uh, so you get uh, an account, you have a limit, you have an interest rate, and you can spend up to a certain amount, and then you kind of pay it over a period of time. And your interest is calculated based upon what your balance is at a particular time every single month, and then you have a due date. That's basically how they function. Credit cards are designed to be short-term financing, and I know that we get into issues where people can have too much credit card debt, and then it obviously becomes very difficult to manage because credit cards by nature are not designed to be long-term long -term sources of financing because the interest rates get up potentially in 15 to 25%. You know, it's not a very good way to, you know, uh, gain access to money. It's not very cheap money, uh, but if you need it for a short period of time, then it doesn't end up being that expensive, at least nominally. Uh, moving on down the list too, uh, we have mortgage companies. And a mortgage company is an institution that primarily deals with mortgages. And so these are the institutions that you might uh, contact to obtain a loan to purchase a home and similar to you know other institutions right there's an evaluative process that takes place where they're going to want to assess your ability to pay and your credit score and your debt to income ratio and all these different things and they're going to determine how much money to lend you and what interest rate you're going to pay and what kind of terms so again not a depository institution and something that's very very helpful because um, economically, people purchasing homes is a really good thing for our economy overall. And so having access to this kind of capital is very helpful to encouraging home ownership 
and then of course all of the other spending that coincides with home ownership. Uh, and now, I mean, mortgage companies today, with interest rates as low as they are, home purchases have been increasing. Um, and in partly due to the low interest rate environment that we find ourselves in sort of as a result of COVID-19 and the government trying to stimulate the economy a little bit uh, as much as we can. Uh, the last one, and this is sort of similar, uh, is a finance company. And I know this is really broad, uh, but think uh, when you think of a finance company, all you want to think about is some an institution that provides loans. And these loans can be to businesses, can be to consumers. Um, a great example of a finance company is every single major car company has a finance kind of company attached to it. Um, so Fo Ford Motor has a finance company, and that's the company that they use to provide loans to vehicles that are buying Ford vehicles. Uh, so that's a finance company, again, not a depository institution, very similar with regards to the evaluation process that takes place. Um, but, you know, again, another non-depository institution, but one that provides access to capital, of course. So um, really not getting into the efficacy or advantages or disadvantages of any one of these things. Again, broadly speaking, the differences between the two is whether or not they accept deposits as a condition for providing services. All depository institutions will require deposits prior to offering services. Non-depository institutions, it is not a requirement associated with getting services provided. So hope that helps with the distinction between the two, as well as the breakdown of the different types of entities within those two. Thanks for watching. Take care.